In this tutorial, I'll teach you the basics of using gradients, along with several ways you can use them in your digital art. Let's start with some universal gradient controls you will find in many art applications. I'll begin in Photoshop, but I will show you other gradient tools throughout this lesson. First, you'll need to select the gradient tool. As of the recording of this video, the interactive gradient feature you'll see here is only available in the beta version of Photoshop. To create a gradient, drag a line from one end of the canvas to another. Depending on the application you are using, you may see a live preview that you can change interactively, or you may have to draw the line first and wait to see the result until after. I prefer the live preview, and hopefully more applications adopt this feature. If you have this mode, you can move the start and end points of the gradient to expand or contract it, or change the angle. If you're not seeing a gradient, it could be that you do not have more than a single color selected, or you need to choose the correct mode. You should have a library of gradient presets you can choose from. Try selecting one of those to practice with. Any simple linear gradient with only a few colors will work for now. The start and end points of the gradient and any of the colors in the middle are known as nodes or color stops. These represent each individual color and its position in the gradient. You can move these around to redistribute the colors or expand or compress the colors to create various effects. There may even be intermediate points in between nodes that can further compress the colors. This has the effect of sharpening sections of the gradient. Gradients can be expressed in several different modes. Most commonly, you will use linear, which we see here, or radial, which we can switch to. There are other modes, but I rarely use them, if at all. You can experiment with these if you like. There are some exotic modes like the spiral in Corel Painter. I'll return to the radial mode. In addition to creating nodes of color, you can also assign varying levels of opacity to each node. Nodes can even be fully transparent. Many art applications have a preset for main color to transparency. This will allow you to select a color and fade it out to nothing using a gradient. We'll explore practical applications for this later. Another important setting for the gradient tool is the method it uses to express the colors. Most gradient tools only offer the standard mode, which does a terrible job of blending colors together in a natural way. If I make a linear gradient that goes from indigo to yellow, you can see that I get a dull or muddy transition. Gray is not the color you would expect to get if you mix yellow and blue, but in computer color, things are a little different. When using this method, you have to be careful about which colors you select. I have a tutorial about color mixing if you're interested in that. Photoshop happens to offer two additional methods called linear and perceptual. These do a much better job of blending one color to the next in a natural way. As you can see, linear creates a very bright transition. You can see the purpose of this lightning if you view the gradients in grayscale. Here you can see the gradient has a very linear and smooth transition without sudden jumps in brightness. The perceptual method blends the gradient closer to how the human eye perceives color. In this case, yellow and blue are separated by a green color, much like they would be if you blended traditional paint. If I view these in grayscale again, you can see that the perceptual transition is also smoother than the classic method. Aside from Photoshop and Krita, not many art applications support additional color blending methods for gradients. And the final universal properties we will explore are blend modes. When you create a gradient, you may be able to blend it with underlying layers in various ways. By now, I think you're beginning to see the potential for how you can utilize gradients in your artwork. So let's dive into some specific techniques. We'll start with the easiest application, simple backgrounds. There are all sorts of illustrations and designs that can benefit from a gradient background. This could be a very colorful gradient, or one that hardly changes at all with a subtle shift between only two or three colors. Gradients can create a sense of movement in a composition, but they can also be very distracting and draw focus away from the subject of the scene if there are too many colors, or the colors just don't harmonize. So take it easy with the gradient tool. One of the most common ways I use gradients is to create a sky effect. Depending on the colors you choose and the way you distribute the colors, you can create skies of all types. If you've created a gradient you might want to reuse, be sure to save it to your gradient library. You don't have to leave gradients as is, you can blend them to create a more hand-painted effect. Any blender will work for this, but Corel Painter has a really neat Express Paint feature that does the blending automatically. 
It even allows you to work with a live preview so you can experiment with various gradient properties and colors. One gradient can be quite effective, but what happens if we repeat the gradient or even mirror it? This opens the doors for all sorts of creative effects like pattern generation, for example. As you can see, Corel Painter allows me to repeat the gradient and mirror it in various ways, which creates a ribbed pattern when used with the linear mode and a monochromatic color palette. You may even be able to generate gradient patterns on two axes to create more complex patterns and even textures like this quilted pattern. This is just a grid of linear gradients that repeats. For example, I could use the quilted pattern I made to create the illusion of fabric on the clothing of a character. I have simply loaded the pattern as the texture for the brush I'm painting with, but you can also overlay the pattern in other ways. Naturally, if you can fill a background with a gradient, you can fill 2D shapes and text as well. Because this sort of work is more easily done in a vector application, I'm demonstrating this in Adobe Illustrator. But you can also use selections or live effects to trap gradients inside shapes in roster applications like Photoshop. As you can see, gradients really enhance the appearance of text and simple shape elements. Now let's go outside the box a bit and explore some advanced ways you can use gradients. Did you know you can use gradients to create brushes? The airbrush is a radial gradient that fades to transparency. You can create custom brushes that use gradients in all sorts of ways. It's worth experimenting with making dabs out of gradients to see what effects you can get. If an airbrush is just a radial gradient, then a radial gradient can be used in place of an airbrush in many cases. By using a radial gradient that fades to transparency, you can easily create lighting effects. This could be sunlight spilling into the scene from outside of it, or you could create a smaller sun in the sky. You can even give objects a subtle glow, or use gradients to create small round lights. You may even want to use a combination of gradients and airbrushes to achieve the kind of look you want. Just as well, you can do simple shading with gradients in place of the airbrush. Just like I filled 2D shapes earlier, I can fill faces, eyes, hair, and other objects to give them basic shading. Unless you're going for an intentionally simplified look, using gradients as is for all of your shading is going to make your work look amateurish. Most objects have complex contours that the gradient needs to match properly in order to look realistic. There are many objects where using a gradient as is for shading is appropriate. For example, spheres and cylinders look much more consistent if you just use a gradient rather than try to hand paint them. You can even use applications like Corel Painter to draw with pattern pens using gradients. This allows you to draw noodle-like strokes that have a 2.5D depth to them. You can draw tree trunks and branches, fence posts, tentacles, and all sorts of objects that would be very tedious to shade using a flat color brush. If this feels like it's cheating, it's not. It's not uncommon for traditional painters to load their brushes with several colors at once to get a similar result. So save yourself some time and just use gradients when you can. In addition to using gradients additively, you can also use them subtractively in layer masks. Layer masking allows you to paint onto a special sublayer that controls the opacity of pixels on each layer. Rather than painting onto the mask with a brush, I can use gradients for more precise control. As you can see, I can create a see-through effect using a radial gradient that goes from black to transparency. Another advanced way to use gradients is to vary the color of your brush. You can select a range of colors in a gradient, and your brush will only paint with those colors. This can be very useful for adding a lot of detail to your painting without having to switch colors manually. Again, this is a lot like loading multiple colors on a traditional brush. The final method for using gradients is gradient mapping. This is the process of recoloring an image using the colors from a gradient. This can be used as a creative filter, or you can use it to colorize grayscale artwork like portraits though there are much better ways to colorize images using neural filters. There you have it, a boatload of ways you can use gradients in your digital art. If you're new to my channel, subscribe for more digital art lessons like this. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.